All right, awesome. All right, so um, uh, Rob, thank you for a very kind introduction. I think um, for those of you who are, you know, uh, who've never heard of Flightstream before, as Rob said, we've, we've been presenting in some of the previous, um, you know, um, workshops each year. So you can actually see some of the basic stuff about Flightstream in some of our older presentations and the material from and the recordings that are available. What I want to do today is actually give you an update on some of the newer stuff that we've been working in the last year. Um, some of this stuff I think will be kind of interesting given you know how much or you know OpenBSP gets used uh, inside the UAM community, for example. Um, and then I'll also talk about some of the fidelity enhancements we've been doing to some of our viscous coupling stuff. So um, I think I have the hour, but I'll I'll split this up into two uh, 20-minute talks, I guess. Okay. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is some of the enhancements we've been doing towards uh, making Flightstream compatible for um, aeroacoustics analysis. And um, I'll jump into this uh, very quickly, very briefly. So this is an abridged version of the slides that I have, you know, that we just recently presented to uh, NASA. So I think those those viewers on the NASA side can have the full version of this uh, presentation. I think already, and I know some of the audience has already seen that. But um, for for everyone else, um, I'll present a quick overview of uh, what we did. So uh, we partnered up with uh, Auburn University and, and UC Davis, and actually, you know, came up with the uh, the argument that okay. Acoustics should be simpler. It should be easier. Most airplane, you know, designers, you know, are not aeroacoustics experts, but everybody needs to know the acoustic signatures of the airplanes they're building, especially for the electric DEP and uh, UAM air concepts. And so the idea was, could we come up with a easy to use toolbox, uh, you know, inside Flightstream, which would allow you to do the aero with the, with the, with the unsteady solver using OpenVSP based geometries. But then once you're done with that, could you just do the acoustics there, um, you know, and, and see what we can, you know, what we could make of that. So that was the overall idea. Here's I'm going to I'm not going to go into full detail on this, but I'll just show you what, what the layout looks like. So this is actually something that, um, you know, we took from a paper uh, from, from one of our collaborators on this project, Sonki Lee, uh, Professor Sonki Lee at uh, UC Davis. Um, and so he had this very nice layout, which I think is very illustrative of what we're trying to do. So, you know, we are trying to, you know, characterize the different sources of noise um, that come from a UAM aircraft, right? And the full, and obviously given our focus on the flow solver side, we're focusing on the flow noise. Okay, within that, we have the ability to do the tonal noise, which is the thickness and loading stuff. So that's, you know, that is something that, you know, you, you, you see with, for example, PSU WAP WAP and some of these other implementations with the um, acoustic analogies. Um, we wanted to implement that directly into the flight stream um, setup. So this isn't essentially a coupling. This is not a coupling between ANOP or PSU WAP WAP or an existing acoustics tool with the flight stream software. This is actually directly in the source code uh, an implementation for an acoustics module using the same formulation. And we were assisted here, obviously, by the fact that NASA has been very graciously publishing a lot of their material on how some of these, you know, what the formulations and everything. So we said, okay, if it's if it's all in one source code in inside Flightstream, then we can support it commercially, and we can, you know, we can enhance it and other stuff. So we kind of went that route. So all the yellow boxes is stuff that we we currently finished up. The things we are now getting ready to do is the broadband noise, which is where. Um, Professor Lee and his uh, his team bring a lot of expertise to play, um, and that is the issue of the uh, you know the different components of broadband noise, which is the boxes colored in purple here is what we'd be addressing in essentially the phase two of this project. Um, so jumping ahead, um, I'm going to just show you. I mean, this is just you know for most people who have dabbled with the acoustics, this is something that is very familiar to them. So the we went on with the uh, you know formulation one A for the acoustics analogy to do the um, the tonal noise components. And the key takeaway here is that we are able to compute acoustic pressure as a function of time, right, at various observer locations. And the user, and, sorry, and the solver inputs essentially with the unsteady solver is the blade motion and the time derivatives and the blade loading and the time derivatives, right? So I've kind of labeled some of the um, some of the terms here that uh, you know feed you know that feed in from the flight stream solver into the acoustics module. So uh, you know, we you know, there's not you know I'm just mentioning this from the sake of for the sake of completedness, but essentially the you know the formulation one A we went with thickness and loading, but not quadruple. 
Okay, quadrupole term is computationally expensive, but also it is something that shows up when you have like very high compressibility effects, supersonic wing, you know, supersonic blade dips and things like that. And for UAM and DB aircraft, I mean, you know, it, it was, the argument was that that's, you know, not going to be the use case that we need to particularly worry about right now. And so we're only focusing on the thickness and loading terms for this, for the early phase. And then the, uh, the implementation is basically a source time dominant type algorithm. So it allows us to essentially, you know, um, do this, you know, very, very quickly. Okay, in terms of computation. And I think with a quadrupole term, we'll revisit that in the future. Uh, if it, you know, if it turns out that uh, that is actually something we can expand the flight stream solver to outside of, uh, you know, DEP and UAM aircraft, it might be possible to actually find other applications where, um, you know, very high compressibility effects come into play. I'm sorry, come into play. Okay, so uh, here's the picture. Okay, and just showing, I guess, the overall layout of how the the, the solver integration works. We have an acoustics toolbox now from the user perspective. You know, so the user uh, essentially gets to create things like the observer locations and the, um, you know, they can create acoustic volume sections, acoustic spheres. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, specified time resolutions at the observer, things of that nature. And then behind the scenes, what what uh, what the what the solver is doing is that you basically run a standard unsteady solution in Flightstream. So you load a VSP model. You know, you go into Flightstream, you set up all the stuff you normally do with a with a standard setup. And then you know, as part of the stand, you know, the solution, the Flightstream automatically has already you know stored and computed all the acoustic information from the sources. So any surface that has been applied in motion definition. Um, you know, moving blade, a flapping surface. It doesn't have to be rotary specific. Um, then they are essentially co computed ahead of time. And then based on where the user specifies observer locations, we are able to uh, use the uh, source time dominant algorithms to uh, interpolate and uh, generate the uh, integrated acoustic signatures. So we added some tools to actually make life easier, and I want to show this. So uh, what I did, was, by the way, you'll see this uh, airplane again and again. So I think for those of you on the call, you'll recognize this instantly. It's the um, I took the OpenVSP model for the uh, the Joby S4 uh, that's on the um, hangar, and I loaded it up in VSP, exported it from there with a CompGeom mesh, and sent it to Flightstream. So um, in this case, what we're you know like some pictures here that you're seeing. So um, this is our acoustic volume section. So you can actually use this to generate, uh, you know, like animated time histories of these signals. And these volume sections can be arbitrarily sized and oriented and things like that. Um, and on this one, you know, uh, we, we're actually going, I'm going to show some results as well for the full vehicle, but, you know, you can test like, for example, multi-rotor configurations. It's not, it's not specific to a single rotor or anything. You can, you should be able to do like, so if you take the effort to make a, a VSP model with all the bells and whistles, you should be able to transfer that one for one and go and do the um, flight stream plus the acoustic analysis. So I'm going to play a little bit of a video so you can kind of see what what it works like inside flight stream. So here's that aircraft that has just been completed, um, you know, with the uh, unsteady solver. Okay, and so there's an acoustic toolbox. So the, the, the on the left that panel opens up. You can specify that button that I just did over there for the acoustic volume section. And here, this is where you can choose local coordinate systems and other things in flight stream to kind of choose whatever orientation and refinement you want. The resolution, I guess, of microphones inside that plane. Um, and then you can specify the, um, the time resolution, the observer time resolution on the left. So that's the, um, the main window. And then when you click the button, it's essentially, you know, it goes ahead and does the computation. So. What's going to happen? I mean, the the, U, uh, the GUI and all is interactive through this whole time. But the point is that right now this is all in serial implementation. So even though the flight stream solver is fully, um, you know, it's fully uh, paralyzed, uh, the acoustic module is not. And that's the other thing we're going to be doing in phase two is uh, we're going to transfer over some of the parallel computing stuff directly over to the. Uh, Acoustics module, but anyway. So once you generate a volume section here, then you can use the um, you know that slider there to kind of generate essentially the, an animation of the time history uh, as the signal generates and propagates in that plane. Okay, this stuff can be exported. So this can be then taken out and uh, essentially you know you can use this for post processing in MATLAB or anywhere else that you would like to. Okay, so oh. Uh, I guess, uh, let's see, I need to go to the next slide here. There we go. Okay, so the next thing we also added was the ability to create acoustic spheres, 
OK, and so this is again a very nice tool that is able to take your full aircraft and generate the acoustic pressures uh, across a sphere uh, around it and the user can size the sphere and uh, the resolution on it and things like that. And then that again can be used for spherical propagation and analysis and post processing analysis of the signal. So here I'm showing a picture where you have the Joby aircraft, but you have just one propeller operating. OK, and so you see at different time steps what the acoustic uh, pressure signal looks like across the surface of the sphere. And much like the um, much like the actual uh, volume section, it works the same way in the GUI. So you you have your, you know, your solution done over there. You go ahead and, you know, so in this case, again, I'm going to go and pull in the um, acoustics toolbox. And, you know, we have the, the third button from the top, which is the, um, the acoustic sphere. And you know similar user interface like before. So as you can see, I mean the focus here has been to make life easy for the user who you know uh, you know without having to necessarily do like file transfers and other things. I mean this is the benefits of having like a direct integration at the at the source code level, right? Is that we can do a lot of the we can make the process very streamlined and user friendly. Okay, so same thing as before. It's going to go through uh, the, the run here. We'll just wait for it real quick. And I know it, it sounds, it looks painful just looking at that progress bar, but believe me, we're, we're working on making that parallel, so. All right, okay, so once that is computed, then just like the volume sections, you can actually move the um, acoustic signals and see the um, acoustic pressure as a function of time on the surface, okay? So uh, this is, in, in this case, it's for the full vehicle, so it's not as clean as the pictures I showed in my previous slide. All right. Um, okay, so I'll pause this here. We'll go to the next stuff. So the other thing we did is we want to take the acoustics implementation and get it to a point where you know conceptual aircraft designers can they build their model in VSP, they do the aero and flight stream, they do the acoustic pressure calculations for different locations, but then compute the post-processing terms that make more sense from a aircraft certification perspective. You know, so we want to we want to have the output post processing of the acoustics in a way that uh, makes sense for people who are trying to, um, you know, for example, get FAA level certification or figure out how loud their aircraft is in terms um, that the um, you know that is generally understood. So we have added you know the these post processing metrics to the toolbox. So you can do things like frequency domain analysis, you know, with the power spectral density. You can do uh, you know OSPL levels. And, and then I've kind of marked over here the sound exposure levels, perceived noise levels, and the effective perceived noise levels as being the critical, I mean, not critical, but it's one of the key parameters that, you know, get, you know, take that, that show up in the aircraft certification process. And one of the outputs that comes out is things like this polar chart on the right, where you can put in the aircraft or, you know, whatever the source of your acoustic signal is at the center, and then generate the, um, you know, generate the, uh, the basically the, the far field OSPL lines, you know, for different radius locations, for example. So you can see the, uh, the acoustic signal at, you know, different orientations around the aircraft and at different distances. Okay, um, just showing here, you know, how the toolbox works behind the scenes for the post processing stuff. So we do take the acoustic pressure signal, right, you know, basically apply the fast Fourier transform analysis on it. And one thing leads to another. So the, you know, that analysis leads us to the power spectral density, which leads us to the OSPL numbers. And then, you know, further down, it leads us to the um, uh, perceived and effective perceived noise levels. OK, so the user will have access to all of these terms and then, you know, so effectively you can actually work directly as, you know, so this is all scriptable, obviously, as, as the, along with the rest of Lightstream. So in theory, if you're wanting to quantify your acoustic signal as part of, let's say, a design process, so you do, you have the VSP part scripted up, you have the flight stream part scripted up, and then you should be able to also then script up the acoustics part and have that those metrics uh, feeding back into your design process, for example. OK. Um, I'm going to show some uh, some testing work that we did. I'm not going to call it validation because that was not our objective in phase one, and there's a lot of ground to cover when we say validation. Uh, but we did some initial verification to make sure that you know what we are generating is consistent with what you expect from WAPWAP and ANOP, and also experimental data wherever we could find you know wherever we could make it work. So the classical validation case is the um, you know, is the UH1H rotor, right, um, for the Huey. And so this is just a 0012 twin bladed setup, okay? And we run this in flight stream in the hover mode, and then we ran it for uh, different advanced ratios. 
and uh, it's a it's a one is to I mean it's, it's a small scale version of the uh, of the full full rotor okay and it's run at a, a different RPMs. The reason we took the uh, twelve ninety six RPM is because you know that's the lower RPM where your you know the quadrupole term is not dominant. So that again goes back to what I was saying earlier is that in this case you know once you start having supersonic tips and other things uh, we're going to underpredict the acoustic signal. I mean we just don't have the physics for that in there yet. Uh, but for everything else, okay, we should be pretty good. So just to show you what we have there. Um, so on the on the left hand, uh, I mean on the right hand side, you have this picture. This is the hover, and what we did was uh, uh, there was some original data presented by Brentner uh, for the wop wop code for the same rotor, and so I kind of plotted the overall noise, um, you know, in pascals, I guess, uh, and then versus the. Um, so we had to post process this thing because in flight stream the stuff that comes out is in observer time, but we post process this to the normalized time scale for the for the blade rotor basically the blade period um, and so this is I, I put in the reference here from where we got the um, the wop wop data um, and so we compared it I mean it looks pretty good in the sense that the key features of the overall noise uh, at, at the relative at the right time scale location is captured this is for the hover um, for forward flight what we did was um, so we, we in flight stream we don't have the ability to do like you know like detailed helicopter rotor blades where you have like full articulation and everything but this one was simpler because you had just a 8.85 degrees forward disc build and then uh, there we actually were able to compare it with um, the um, you know the experimental data and so that kind of looks like this okay where on the there are two you know I, I won't go into the details but i've put in the reference there and so the you know the different mic locations are kind of all described in that reference by connor um so that's a nasa document and so again i mean you know the, the i'll just mention that mic four and mic five here are the um, are two microphones placed upstream of the rotor okay in forward flight uh on the uh, on the advancing side and on the receding side okay so that's the uh, difference between the two here uh, sorry, but difference between the two here. Um, so yeah, so it, you know, essentially speaking, we don't capture some of the other noise that you see, the yellow dots in the experiment, but the key, you know, spikes in the acoustic signal, the tonal noise signal, we do capture that. Okay, so this is um, this is the, one of the verification tests we did. So then we, you know, the temptation was real. You know, we wanted to see, okay, can we now take a full-fledged, you know, vehicle uh, from, you know, VSP and, you know, just go all the way, you know, do a, a series of tests as though we were doing it for a full vehicle. And so we did that. So we, so I, you know, as I said, I took the, um, the, the Joby S4 model that was put on the VSP hangar recently. And um, so what we do here is a, a slight verification to our workflow. So we take the VSP model and we export it as a plot 3D geometry, okay? Um, and then that goes into flight stream. The rotors, we can do either solid representations or thin representations, but there's not, performance-wise, there's no, uh, sorry, um, the analysis-wise, there's not any difference if, between the two. And in fact, for thin propeller blades, you can actually, I mean, you, you get much the same results as thick. So there's not too much to be gained there. Um, but then we, you know, we do the uh, Boolean Unite using Comp Geom through flight stream. So one of the reasons we do that is because for these uh, swept cases where, you know, Plot 3D is a fully structured file format, you know, so coming out of VSP. So that generates a full structured mesh and we retain that information. So when we do the Comp Geom, we actually store, you know, we, we uh, you know, because we're kind of interacting with Comp Geom and, next, you know, uh, things that come out and go into flight stream is STL. We actually use the um, flight stream, you know, function for call Com geom so that we can store the quads information before and after. Okay. Long story short, I mean it's still the same com geom workflow. It's just that there's some additional data storage that we do on the flight stream side, and that's why we prefer that workflow now. Um, so we tested the first case by putting just one propeller, the one picture you see on the right. Okay, and we tested that at 955 RPM. So the tip Mach number was 0.4. Okay, and then we placed microphones in the polar array at 50 hundreds and 150 meters, so 36 microphones each. And so you get something that looks like this. Okay, so you know, you we basically are showing here the different signals uh, that you see at um, various locations around the aircraft, uh, around the propeller. Now, I should mention that uh, we, we don't have models for acoustic shielding and scattering inside flight stream yet. That's our phase two activity, okay? So it means that when you're doing this analysis, the presence of the fuselage is, uh, is, is, is seen aerodynamically. So the flight stream solver and the propeller are interacting with each other aerodynamically. But acoustically, that pressure signal, uh, that acoustic pressure signals are going straight through the fuselage, okay? There's no blockage effect right now. 
So that's one of the obvious enhancements that we're looking to do uh, for the acoustic uh, shielding so that you can see a difference whether or not you have a fuselage in there. Okay. Uh, but other than that, though, you see like this kind of lobe shaped structure, which is classical, you know, for this kind of uh, an acoustic signal for a single propeller. So the so the least acoustic pressure is at the front and back, as you can see on the, the two plots over here. OK, and the maximum signal is on the sides where you where the tip of the blade kind of crosses right in front of the microphone. Um, so, yeah, so overall, it, you know, the very, very representative of what you would expect. And so, you know, it looks like it's and, and, the, and the radial this, the plot over here is the, the decibels. So you're essentially seeing about a 60 decibel, or, you know, uh, number. This is at the 50 meter, uh, you know, distance. Um, we also tested it to see, you know, what happens. Oh, sorry, what happens if you have a wake and no wake? Now, this this is entirely academic, right? I mean, because um, there's not going to be a real life scenario where you're going to have a, a no wake setup, okay? Um, and so, but we wanted to see if the if you get back to the classical eight shaped lobe on the acoustic signal, if you don't have the effects of wake and other stream kind of like messing that up. And sure enough, we do see that effect. So this is just, as I said, just a quick academic and a canonical verification test, okay? So next thing we did was we started, we said, okay, now, now let's go back and switch on all the props, okay? And so we did that. Now the signal is a lot more messier, okay? As we would expect. And here, I mean, we still see the classical characteristics. In, in other words, the acoustic pressure is still the, you know, the largest uh, on the tip. So the, the, the eight figure is still maintained, but we see like spikes and other shape effects that are now coming in uh, because of the, um, the presence of the rotors, okay? So, so that shows up. Um, on, as I said before, since we're able to do post-processing on this stuff, we are able to then convert, you know, the time history for the uh, pressure, acoustic pressure uh, into the power spectral density versus frequency plots. And then you can actually see the 955 RPM main rotor, you know, spikes as well as the, as well as the harmonic tones uh, showing up in the analysis. Okay, so this is, this is stuff that you get out of the toolbox. Um, and then, you know, as I said, the temptation is real. So we went one further and I saw that on the VSP hangar, we have a, you know, a Kitty Hawk KH, uh, H1 aircraft also loaded up. And we, you know, just to kind of, you know, illustrate the ease of use, we kind of did the exact same workflow. I mean, and what the key thing we were looking for here is just to see, you know, if you have two different shapes of aircraft, if you have two different, completely different layouts between, let's say, the Joby one and the Kitty Hawk one here, will you, will this tool be sufficient to pick up the difference in acoustic signals because that's going to be a key parameter in in saying that acoustics can become part of your you know your early design workflow right and sure enough you kind of see that now by the way keep in mind different operating conditions different designs different scales here so don't you know <laughs> it's it's very tempting to say oh look at this aircraft it's you know it's better than this one or whatever but um be you know be warned that don't do that but you know but you get the overall idea okay um, and the main thing I was going to say is that we are right now looking to do some qualitative tests. I'm hoping that the the Joby guys will will you know be interested in you know like I know they're doing working with NASA to do some acoustic tests, and I'm hoping to get us involved with some of that because I mean we've had we have some data points for their acoustic signals at different locations, and it does look like we kind of match some of these numbers. But it'd be nice to actually get our hands on the uh, you know on some real world data uh, either from NASA or from the industry side, and so we can do some of those tests. Okay, um, I think I, I finished about five minutes uh, with to spare. So what I could do is, um, it's just a very quick summary, but I can feel some questions, I guess, um, in the meantime. We don't have any questions queued up right now, Vivek, so. Okay, uh, um, should I wait a, about 30 seconds before uh, maybe going into the new topic? Uh, yeah, we can give just a, yeah, we can give a moment for the lag on the video to catch up to see if anybody asks any questions. So let's give it a minute. Okay. I don't know if this is while we're waiting. I'll I'll just interject something myself. I don't know if this will help you, but the um, the new VSP Aero, the VSP Geom, sorry, the VSP Geom file format that I'm developing with Dave. Part of it is to support uh, mixed thick and thin geometries, but the other thing we're doing is, in, in addition to writing out triangles, we're writing out the UV surface coordinates of every node. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would be helpful, actually. And then, yeah, would that be enough to allow you guys to not have to use the plot 3D and then come back and do CompGeom after? I'm not, I'm not sure if that would give you enough. The other thing yeah, I'm also I, doing is I'm, I'm pre-identifying wakes. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so that's well, I think I think it might be identifying wakes and we're adding UV surface information. I think I think what what we what we really are missing though is that I mean and it's less of an issue for these UAM aircraft because I mean they don't have like these highly swept like military wings and stuff like that you know, but the but the issue is that after Comgeom I think you know you just you know you get a bag of triangles out right and and the the STL file when it gets written I mean we lose all that information for how you know the the orientation of the ports that was that was there in the clean VSP file right and so um, is if there's a way to just you know like either write this the STL file in such a way that triangle pairs are written together so that we can restore the horns, uh, or maybe just you know like some other information that can be provided where the quad IDs are there. So it says quad number so and so is made up of triangle number this and this. You know something like that. Uh, what we are doing right now is we are essentially using the you know the, the, the vertex coordinates and everything. So because we know everything is a quad when it comes in from Proc 3D, um, so we use that. And then when the uh, the CompGeo mesh comes out, we go in and check the query, the the vertices and everything, and see which triangles are between them and convert them back into quads. It's not perfect, but I mean it, it does work. Um, anything that makes that kind of process easier would actually be very helpful, I think. Okay, well, we can we can talk some more offline and and uh, yeah, we're we're trying to make things easier for for Kenny and it, the things things same things will probably make life easier for you and vice versa. I, I completely agree. Yeah, if you could maybe just uh, add us to any discussions that are going on that one, I'd be very happy to attend those. So one question did come up, which was, um, can you explain on how the noise noise shielding is planning on being? approached if you if you have any plans for that. Yeah, yeah so so okay so there's acoustic scattering and there's acoustic shielding right and those are two different topics acoustic scattering is a very complex topic and we in, in our current approach we're we're not planning to implement that yet uh, because we're going to look and see what the computational impact of those numerical schemes is going to be uh, acoustic shielding, on the other hand, you know, we're you're going to be using the ray acoustics and diffraction models. Um, so this is stuff that Professor Lee has some publications on that I can I can point to. Um, but essentially, the you know the idea there is that you're going to be looking at some initial line of sight calculations. Um, you know, to see is an observer you know in the line of sight of an acoustic signal. If not, what is the kind of surface in between? What is the diffraction that's happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem is that the tonal noise calculations are all based on low frequency stuff. So acoustic shielding is is kind of uh, is less of an issue than you might think. But then when we do the broadband noise, which is the high frequency stuff, then those ray acoustics models really should be useful because um, you know the, the high frequency stuff, the acoustic shielding. Interestingly enough, becomes a little simpler uh, because then you have like you can actually model the blockage effects. Um, I don't have time to go into the full details right now, but I can definitely point to uh, some references in the chat after I'm done here. I, I think that probably gives them a good uh, idea of where you're looking to go. Yeah. Okay. 